잠시 안내드리겠습니다. 저희 곧 다시 강연 진행하겠습니다. 혹시 밖에 계신 분들께서는 안으로 들어오셔서 자리에 착석해 주시면 감사드리겠습니다. 곧 강연 진행하겠습니다. 밖에 계신 참석자 여러분들 안으로 들어와 주시면 감사드리겠습니다. 고맙습니다. ね、もう、ちょっとちょっとちょっとちょっとちょっとちょっとちょっとちょっとちょっとちょっとちょっとちょっとちょっとちょっとちょっとちょっとちょっとちょっとちょっとちょっとちょっとちょっとちょっとち
but hopefully I will be able to walk through some of the recent developments in US law as it pertains to fair use and its applicability to machine learning and specific, specifically on the training of machine learning models using copyrighted materials. Uh, what we're seeing in terms of some recent fair use decisions and reliance on some prior fair use decisions uh, based on the more recent ones. So to begin with some basics that I'm sure all of you are well familiar with, which is the basic working of large language models, otherwise known as foundation models, such as ChatGPT. Basically, these are machine learning models that are trained on vast amounts of data. Uh, the way they work is basically by analyzing a lot of this data for predictive purposes in order to generate a sequence and pattern. So what they do is basically take large amounts of content that they're then broken down into component parts assigned specific tokens, a process that is often described as tokenization for the machine to keep track, and then uh, the creation and recognition of patterns of repetition in the data based on the predictive role of these tokens. The process is obviously very complicated. I don't need to tell all of you. Uh, it entails multiple stages of cleaning of the data, deduplication, ensuring elements of memorization are removed, and the like. But the basic idea is that these models rely on large amounts of data. Now, very importantly, from a functional point of view, most of the time, uh, these machine learning models make a local copy of all the training data that they rely on for the purposes of their input function. Uh, this isn't a necessity, but this seems to be the general approach based on efficacy. And the model then, after making that local copy, ingests the data and learns from it to be able to produce outputs. And it's important to recognize that these outputs may then, may or may not be similar to the training data itself, right? So my focus is entirely on the input and ingestion function. The output may or may not be similar. That tends to vary depending on the way in which the model is structured and the input um, output correlation that it relies on. So the core question that has come up in multiple lawsuits in the United States and it rem remains unresolved, which my presentation is going to address, is whether this use of training data by machine learning models, by these large language models, constitutes copyright infringement, right? So obviously, in order to answer that question, the first preliminary thing that we need to address is the type of data that is used. I mean, obviously, for it to amount to copyright infringement, the data or the input works that are relied on need to be under copyright. So we begin by asking the obvious question for many of these machine learning models, which is, where is the data sourced from? And the answer that we routinely seem to get from multiple creators of these machine learning models is that they rely on publicly available data or publicly available information and informational sources and works. Now, obviously, as we know in the copyright world, much of what is publicly available, even if it's publicly accessible, is under copyright protection. So public availability obviously does not mean being in the public domain, which a lot of these machine learning creators seem to equate. If it's accessible and it's available freely on the internet, it must be in the public domain, which is obviously wrong. So what they rely on most of the time is publicly available data, publicly available works, much of which is under copyright protection, especially if they source it from the internet. Now, obviously, the question becomes somewhat moot if all of the data and all of the work that they rely on uh, is in the public domain, if it's not under copyright protection. Obviously, then there are no copyright issues that are directly implicated in the training process. There may well be, however, ancillary or related re issues pertaining to the modality through which the, the data or the works themselves were accessed, right? So if they were encrypted, or as we'll see when I talk about the GitHub case, if there are issues about how it was processed that go beyond traditional copyright infringement. But the bottom line is if it's in the public domain or if they rely on uh, works and information that are not under copyright protection, copyright infringement becomes somewhat moot. Now, what we're seeing though in practice is that some of the most successful machine learning models use publicly available copyright protected data in significant part, whether this is stability AI or whether it is GPT-4, their reliance is on publicly available data, a large portion of which unquestionably is under copyright protection. Um, many of them also, such as uh, Copilot from GitHub, rely on public repositories with elaborate terms of service, which generates a separate kind of question, uh, even if it's under copyright protection, uh, under a particular licensing format, which we'll talk about uh, separately. But the bottom line is, all of what I'm talking about is implicated in situations primarily where the reliance is on copyright protected uh, information or copyright protected works. Okay, 
The, the next thing to note is how we approach this question in the United States. So one of the issues that has come up in, in many jurisdictions that have tried to answer this question is to differentiate between the types of copying involved to suggest that when machine learning training is going on, it is copying for a non-expressive purpose. I think for a good example of this is what Japan did with its TDM exception, categorically providing that when the use is for a non-expressive purpose, it will be exempt from copyright infringement. And since the machine learning model is merely tokenizing the data, patterning it, not using it for enjoyment in the traditional expressive function, it's seen as non-expressive and therefore beyond the purview of copyright infringement. Very importantly, US law does not contain such a distinction on the question of what constitutes copying, right? So in the US, we have the question of what is copying and has copying been satisfied? And then we move to particular exemptions, most notably fair use. On the question of whether there was copying and whether that copying was improper appropriation, US law does not recognize this distinction between expressive and non-expressive use. Instead, all of the question of whether the use was non-expressive jumps into the fair use analysis once copying has been established. That's why what we see in the United States is an increasing emphasis, some might say a little too much emphasis, on fair use to answer the question of whether machine learning inputs constitute uh, infringement. Okay, so that then takes us to the US fair use provision where under the jurisprudence we will see this distinction has sometimes been made. And the US fair use provision obviously is a codification of prior judge made law, which is characterized in terms of four fair use factors. The first one being the purpose and character of the use, the second being the nature of the protected work, the third being the amount and substantiality of the portion used, and lastly, the market effect, uh, current or potentially future market effect, uh, all of which courts are meant to consider in assessing whether a particular use is a fair use under section 107. And as, as everyone knows, there's an enormous amount of, of one might say complicated uh, jurisprudence that has developed around the fair use doctrine, applying it in different contexts to try and see whether a particular use constitutes fair use. But the most notable variant of fair use that has emerged, which has in some ways um, been raised multiple times in relation to uh, machine learning training, is transformative use, which is a judicially created variant of the fair use doctrine coming out of a notable Supreme Court case known as Campbell versus Acuff Rose, where the court says that under the first fair use factor, the purpose and character of the use, uh, the court is to examine whether the use adds new meaning, purpose, or character, and is therefore in some sense transformative. And what we see in the jurisprudence until we get to the Warhol case is once there is a finding of a heightened amount of transformativeness, it influences the fair use analysis, and very importantly, it influences the rest of the fair use factors. So, so the fair use doctrine in and of itself does not provide an answer. It requires courts to apply these four factors on a case-by-case -case basis individually to the facts of the case to then assess whether a particular use constitutes fair use. The most directly relevant, as many have argued, fair use case for the question of whether machine learning input of copyrighted works constitutes fair use is the 2015 decision of the Second Circuit by Judge Pierre Laval in Authors Guild versus Google. Now, very important thing to note, this is a decision of the Second Circuit, is not a decision of the US Supreme Court, but many argue, especially defendants who are creators of these machine learning models relying on fair use, believe that the Authors Guild case provides something of an answer to find that their use constitutes fair use. So I wanna walk through what Authors Guild, the Google case actually said, it's also often referred to as the Google Books case, what it actually said and whether its analysis is actually that directly and easily applicable to machine learning training. So the case involved an infringement lawsuit by multiple um, authors against Google for its well-known Google Books project, which as many of you know, entailed scanning thousands and thousands of books uh, onto a private protected uh, repository, and then providing the public with a search functionality, which allowed members of the public to locate words and phrases in its database, and the search would re return a result on where exactly those words were available in a particular book. And then a display functionality known as the snippet function, which would provide a little bit of context around where exactly the word appeared on a particular page. 
very importantly, was not as though the entirety of what was copied was made public, except obviously when the work was in the public domain or sometimes when the author consented. But beyond that, the search and snippet functionalities were critical to the Google Books project. Um, and again, very importantly, however, a local private copy was made of all of the books, but this was not publicly accessible. The defendant, Google, relied on the fair use doctrine to argue that its use was exempted from copyright infringement because it was a transformative use and it relied on the Supreme Court case that I mentioned, Campbell versus Acuff Rose. And uh, Judge Pierre Laval, who in many ways had developed the idea of transformative use in a law review article that the Supreme Court adopted in Campbell, was the judge in this case, and he runs the analysis through the four fair use factors in section 107 to conclude that the search functionality and the snippet functioning of Google Books was a fair use. So what exactly does Judge Laval do? What Judge Laval does is he says he focuses primarily on factor one and concludes that the copying that Google undertook for search was a transformative purpose. Why? Because he says the copying of the books that was made was to make available information about the books, not the books themselves. So this distinction between information about the books versus information in the books is a very important one. And he says, this purpose is very different from the original purpose of the book, which is to read information in the books themselves. Uh, and so he says, similarly, the snippet function was designed to tell the searcher where a term appears, not exactly what the page says in its entirety, and so putting all of this together, along with the fact that he says commerciality does not outweigh transformativeness, the fact that the Google Books project and Google was a commercial entity, he says, sure, that does play a role in the analysis, as you can see under factor one, but it doesn't outweigh the transformativeness. So he says that the Google Books project is a transformative use. And then he allows this to influence the analysis of the other fair use factors. He says factor two actually mildly favors fair use since it is not performing a substitutive function. He says factor three, as Campbell had indicated, the amount and substantiality of the use is closely tied to the transformative purpose. And once we've found the transformative purpose, we see that the amount and substantiality are intricately tied to it. And lastly, on market effect, he says, there's no real substitutive harm that cuts against fair use because the purpose is fundamentally different and uh, they're not necessarily derivations from it. So he concludes that the snippet and the search functionality are about information being made available about the books, not information in the books themselves. And in some ways, he says that's a non-expressive function, and therefore it constitutes a fair use. Obviously, um, because of the way in which it's framed in terms of expressive and non-expressive and information about the books as opposed to information in the books, um, <clears throat> machine learning developers in a lot of these lawsuits believe that the fair use analysis coming out of Authors Guild provides them a clear, or at the very least, a substantially solid answer uh, on the fair use question. So the question is, does it really? Is machine learning training uh, really clearly implicated as a fair use uh, based on Authors Guild? And, and, and my answer is, I don't think it easily applies. I think there are many wrinkles that one needs to pay attention to, which suggests that there could be certain hiccups in its extension. Uh, in fact, there's a very good possibility, in my view, that a court will say uh, machine learning training is fundamentally different. So what are some of these crucial differences that a court might take note of? First one is, I think, that this identification of a non-expressive use seems a little bit too blanket to apply automatically to machine learning. Um, yes, Google Books did make the distinction between information about the work versus the work itself, seemingly this distinction between enjoyment and non-enjoyment. But when does that break down? When does providing all the information about the work amount to the work itself? Um, the answer is there comes a point when you, if you provide all available information about the work, including, oh, this word is present here, this other word is present here, the next word is present here, information about the work becomes the work itself. So that distinction seems to become murkier and murkier. Um, what we also see is I don't think Google Books suggests that enjoyment uh, does not arise simply based on the identity of the actor. Just because it's a computer uh, model that is um, reading and processing the work doesn't necessarily mean that it's not enjoyment in the sense of reading the work and processing it, which at the end of the day is exactly what reading entails. And the question that I think a court might and should legitimately ask is, why isn't ingestion and tokenization, which ingestion entails in a machine learning model, more like translation? 
I want you to think about a hypothetical. If the Google Books case was not just about scanning the entirety to produce a search functionality, but was instead, shall we say, translating every available book into another language through a mechanized process, such as Google Translate, would we say that it's a non-expressive use because it's translation, that it's translating? Why isn't what ingestion uh, is in the tokenization process closer to translation that rather than a truly non-expressive function? Translation, we would say, might in fact be a expressive use in some ways. The second reason to, to question whether Authors Guild, the Google Books case, directly applies is because of the way in which the court assumes that commerciality is not very significant in balancing transformativeness. And as we'll see, the Supreme Court has changed that in its recent decision in Warhol. And the last thing is the market effect, which I think for the Google Books case, yes, there wasn't a licensing market for searches uh, and it was an easier case. That is potentially significant with machine learning training, especially on the output side. Uh, right. So if the output allowed by these models is, in fact, potentially substitutive of the inputs, then I think we can't wish away the market effect consideration as part of fair use. So I doubt whether Authors Guild very directly and readily applies to um, machine learning training. And I think it requires uh, a little bit of further digging down to see if it will, in fact, apply. And my view is if one looks at Authors Guild, especially after the Supreme Court's case, in um, Warhol versus Goldsmith, I think there's uh, a real question of whether the fair use doctrine is the right way to think about machine learning training. So AWF versus Goldsmith is this landmark watershed case decided by the US Supreme Court just this year on the fair use doctrine, specifically on the transformative use version of the fair use doctrine. Uh, it involved a relatively straightforward set of facts, nothing to do with heavy technology, where basically Andy Warhol, the famous artist, had, without authorization, produced additional artworks uh, from a photograph, which was initially licensed to a, a, a magazine for him to use for one copy, and he made a, a whole bunch of extra pieces of art. Uh, and then later on, his foundation sought to commercially license it, and that's the point where the photographer said it was an unauthorized use and sues for copyright infringement. Um, and the claim is made that um, what he was doing, Warhol, the Warhol Foundation alleges that its use was a, a transformative use. And the Supreme Court disagrees and says it was not a transformative use, it was not a fair use. And the court answers the question entirely based on factor one, rather than looking at all the other factors. So all of the guidance we get out of the Warhol decision is entirely on factor one. Uh, and the court concludes on factor one that there was not a transformative purpose. So instead of getting into the weeds on what exactly the court says on transformative use, I want to just distill out what I think are some of the core lessons coming out of the Supreme Court's majority opinion in Warhol, which I think extend and apply somewhat to our thinking about machine learning training. The first thing that the court says is that this idea of transformativeness is not an on-off switch. It is a matter of degree, and it's a matter of degree, so the extent of transformativeness of a use has to be balanced against a commercial purpose. So even if something is very, very transformative, well, if it's very commercial too, that gets balanced against the transformativeness or something that is minimally or lesser transformative, but extremely commercial, well, that weighs against fair use. The second thing that the court says is that this category of new meaning or new message cannot be considered in isolation as some courts had done in, in, in expanded the doctrine in a way that allowed defendants to simply say that we're adding some new meaning to this and therefore allowing a fair use claim. The court says, no, we can't just consider that in isolation. We need to look at the particular form of what is actually being done in the individual case. Uh, the third thing the court says is that there's no such thing as a transformative work. There is a derivative work and the right over that derivative work goes to the copyright owner. Uh, the fair use analysis is a focus on the use of the work not the creation of a new work, which leads to the fourth point, which is that the court says in fair use, our unit of analysis to figure out whether something is exempted from liability is a use, not the work itself. So look at the nature of the use. And this brings us to the fifth point where the court says, well, to understand what the use is, and we focus on the purpose under factor one, we need to pay very close attention to how we frame that purpose, right? And this is where I think that the Goldsmith case, the, the Warhol case, um, diverges from prior jurisprudence, potentially including the Google Books case. 
where the court says, first, purpose has to be narrowly calibrated, looking to the market and the substitutive effect. You can't just call something a purpose in broad terms and exempt it from the copyright uh, uh, owner's realm. The second, the court says, if we need to adopt an objective vision of purpose, looking not at what the defendant tells us its purpose was, but looking at how it might be reasonably perceived. And the third thing the court tells us is that this purpose has to be balanced against the derivative works right. Um, and while the Warhol case cites to Authors Guild a few times in its opinion, in my view, those citations are not an acceptance of the underlying holding and outcome in the Google Books case, but instead, they're mostly citations to Judge Pierre Laval's language because he wrote the opinion in that case, and he was also the person who propounded the doctrine of transformative use, which the Campbell case had incorporated. So it's not as though Warhol automatically accepts the Google Books logic. So then what is the answer after Warhol for machine learning training? In, in, does it really now say that machine learning training is not a fair use? Um, I think the answer is not clear, but I think the answer is that it is suspect. Um, what the Warhol case tells us is that the focus in all fair use cases should be on the individual use, not the resulting work. Uh, what this means is that you can't just look at what the final outcome is from machine learning. You have to look at the way in which it was used and the purpose behind it. And the court says the purpose needs to be calibrated very, very carefully. And so what it's implying is that this category of non-expressive that was at play in Google Books is unlikely to be an, a, a satisfactory, satisfactory category in isolation. One might say the court will look at purpose in a much more narrow way and say, what about tokenization and disaggregation? Are these transformative purposes? And one of the things that the court might well say if it's looking at the way in which Warhol was applied is tokenization is potentially within the scope of the derivative works right. Um, is tokenization, which is breaking down the work and, and giving it in, in translating it into a symbol, uh, the creation of a derivative, is it closer to a translation? But I think the purpose is going to be calibrated in a very different way, not just in terms of expressive or non-expressive. And the last thing we know out of Warhol, which was front and center in that decision, is that commerciality will play a very, very important part, right? The fact whether these AI models are being commercially distributed, whether the, their creators are earning some commercial revenue, or whether it was done for purely non-commercial purposes plays an important role in the calibration of whether it is transformative and therefore a satisfying factor one. And finally, I think an issue that was not raised in Warhol but will become a major issue uh, with machine learning models is the output question uh, and the extent to which there is potential or actual market harm. So I think after Warhol, the question of whether machine learning training is automatically fair use becomes somewhat suspect and far more complicated. Now I want to, for a couple of minutes before winding up, move away from fair use to another case, which I know will be of interest to um, everyone interested in computer software around machine learning models. And this is the case uh, of Doe versus GitHub uh, involving a lawsuit against the creator of a machine learning model that had utilized open source software code. And so the basic facts, just to, to recap, um, is that GitHub, as all of you know, is a well-known online repository that hosts software source code. And much of it is uh, in the publicly accessible, so it's a public rep repository, though there's a private repository function and open source. Any code uploaded to GitHub uh, is subject to its very expansive terms of service. But uh, when open source software code is um, uploaded, um, it's subject to obviously the terms, the final further usage is subject to the terms of the open source license, many of which um, uh, GitHub actively encourages or suggests. Now, what happens in the facts of this case is that GitHub develops a ML model known as Copilot, which is an artificial intelligence coding assistant that suggests code to developers who use it. And Copilot employs machine learning to train the model, and it uses and, and reproduces large amounts of code that uh, individual users had uploaded to GitHub, including many under open source licenses. Uh, the machine learning model disregards, um, so the claim goes, attribution, copyright notices, and the terms of the license. Uh, and then uh, eventually the claim also goes that when the model works to generate suggested code, it reproduces as output some of the code that had been produced under these licenses. So a potential class action is brought against GitHub for several causes, uh, but very importantly, not for copyright infringement. 
instead for DMCA breach of licenses and several state law claims. But the DMCA claim, which is a Digital Millennium Copyright Act claim, is a claim brought for the removal of the copyright management information rather than for infringement. And that's important to recognize that an infringement claim was not directly brought because GitHub, obviously, under the terms of service, was already under a license from the copyright owners who are the producers of these code of this code. So it wasn't as though the, the use was completely unauthorized. The argument was that the manner of the use was problematic. And one of the DMCA claims was that GitHub was having the model ignore the copyright management information and that it was violating the terms of the open source license. That was the nature of the claim. Now, the, 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 the lawsuit is obviously going on and there's no final resolution. But in a recent decision by the district court judge uh, in May of this year, um, on a motion to dismiss, the, the judge allows the case to go forward, but eliminates a lot of the claims. And I think it's important to just recognize that the matter is not over. What the court finds, however, is that the individuals who had brought the claim, who are these software coders, did have standing to initiate the lawsuit, but it was limited. Uh, and, and, and the limitation the court finds is because not all of the claims were able to show how exactly the particular code that was produced by these plaintiffs was in fact used, uh, including in the output. So the court insists on some kind of particularization for the for full blown standing. However, the court says, well, we know that once you've submitted the code in, there's a potential for future harm, which is that your code may be spat out by the by the model. And that's enough for standing, but not for damages, but only to seek an injunction. So the court finds some amount of standing. It then also dismisses a whole set of different claims, but allows a few of them to proceed, which are important to take note of, which is this DMCA 1202B claim that has to do with the removal of copyright management information, right? The, uh, the argument that the copyright information was removed from this open source code and a lot of this code by the model and the way in which it was outputted. And the second claim, very importantly, that the court allows to proceed further is the breach of the open source license terms. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in this case. But what I think this is interesting to show is that a lot of these claims um, go beyond fair use because fair use is not at issue in this case because there's not a copyright infringement claim. The claim is really about the DMCA. And because of that, the fair use argument does not really hold because I think one of the arguments that GitHub was hoping to rely on initially was that the machine learning usage or the training was fair use. I think its CEO had even made some statements but that's off the table right now. And the real question is DMCA and breach of license. It'll be interesting to see where this ends up. So to wrap up very, very quickly, um, to get to the question of is fair use a good thing to rely on for machine learning models on the input stage? My answer is it's not ideal. Uh, I think fair use is case by case and very fact specific. Uh, each model has significant variation and we're gonna be playing this game of going from one model to another and the way in which they use it. Alternatives are not ideal either. Collective licensing is not necessarily easy to work with. Um, a categorical answer one way or the other, a full exemption or full liability is very one-sided. I think the ideal situation obviously is a negotiated compromise between content owners and ML developers. Uh, the question really is for that negotiated compromise, where do we set the default? Where do we begin with in order to bring people to the table to have that conversation? And I think uh, it's going to be some time to see where exactly the courts end up. And, and the answer may well be the courts end up one way or the other on fair use, which then provokes parties to enter into deals around those judicial decisions. But the bottom line is the technology is evolving. And in order to develop any legal solution, I think it's crucial that we understand and appreciate the nuances of the technology. My biggest fear in all of this is that we come to a premature solution, whether it's fair use or not, without appreciating the underlying technology and the way in which it evolves. That, I think, would be very, very problematic. Okay, thank you very much. Again, my apologies for not being there in person, and I look forward to any future conversations by email or otherwise. Thank you. 네, 고맙습니다. 아, 직접 함께 하지 못하셨습니다만, 어, 정말 변화하고 있는 이 시대에 여러 가지 정보들, 대안들을 함께 나눠주셨습니다. 콜롬비아 대학교 로스쿨의 샴 크리슈나 발가네시 교수님께 진심으로 감사 인사드리겠습니다. 어, 이번에는 영상 강연을 듣기 전에 또 현장에서 함께하고 계시는 분의 강연을 직접 청해 들어볼까 합니다. 오늘 
멋진 밝은 면지로 포문을 열어주셨던 분이시지요. 1인 유튜버 공유 저작물 활용 사례 소개라는 주제로 유튜버 가야금 예진님께서 발표 준비하고 있습니다. 여러분 따뜻한 박수로 다시 한번 환영해 주시기 바랍니다. 네, 여러분 안녕하세요. 가야금 예진입니다. 먼저 2023 공유 저작물 및 오픈 소스 소프트웨어 라이센스 컨퍼런스에 초청을 해 주셔서 정말 감사드립니다. 저는 오늘 1인 유튜버 공유 저작물 활용 사례에 대해서 발제를 하도록 하겠습니다. 네, 저는 현재 한국 전통 악기인 가야금으로 연주 활동 및 교육을 하면서 유튜브 크리에이터로 활동을 하고 있습니다. 우리나라 전통 가야금은 12줄인 명주실로 만들어진 현악기인데요. 제가 아까 연주하면서도 보여드리고 유튜브 영상에서 주로 보여드리는 가야금은 저 다양한 음악을 연주하기 위해 개량된 25현 가야금입니다. 네, 대중들에게 친숙하고 편안하게 다가가기 위해서 케이팝이나 클래식, 재즈, 그리고 요즘 가장 핫한 트로트까지 다양한 장르의 곡을 편곡해서 가야금 예지라는 유튜브 채널에 제가 공유를 하고 있습니다. 네. 네, 저는 많은 사람들에게 익숙한 곡으로 전통악기인 가야금의 소리를 조금 더 알려드리고 싶어서 2018년부터 유튜브를 시작을 했습니다. 가야금의 대중화와 세계화를 위해서 다양한 장르의 곡을 가야금 버전으로 재창작을 시켜서 영상 콘텐츠를 매주 올리고 있습니다. 정말 영상 하나가 만들어지기까지 많은 생각과 많은 시간이 필요해요. 어떤 곡을 올려야지 조회수가 많이 나올지 구독자분들이 어떤 곡을 좋아할까 라는 고민도 많이 하고요. 네, 저는 영상에 들어가는 한 곡을 재창작시키기 위해 편곡하고 녹음하는 시간이 정말 한 곡당 10시간 정도는 걸리는 것 같습니다. 저의 연주를 듣는 분들에게 저의 진심이 닿길 바라면서 최선을 다해 곡 작업과 영상 작업을 하고 있습니다. 네, 유튜브 채널 외에도 초중고 주, 국악 수업부터 가야금 개인 레슨까지 다양한 활동을 하고 국악 교육에도 열심히 힘을 쓰고 있습니다. 네, 공연이나 연주회, 지역 축제, 그리고 개인 콘서트 등 다양한 공간에서 많은 분들에게 가야금 연주를 여기저기에서 들려드리고 있습니다. 이 외에도 가야금을 더욱 많은 분들에게 알려드리기 위해서 다양한 방송과 제 채널의 라이브 방송 그리고 미디어 출연에도 적극적으로 참여를 하고 있습니다. 네, 현재 제 유튜브 채널에는 약 300개 정도의 동영상이 게재되어 있는데요. 이 중에서도 자체적으로 제작한 곡을 제외하고 약 200개 정도의 동영상은 다양한 음악, 음악 저작물을 활용을 했습니다. 우선 음악 저작권에 대해서 말씀을 드리면 제가 좋아하는 곡을 재창작을 하고 싶어도 그 곡이 저작권이 어떻게 되어 있는지 정확히는 알 수가 없어요. 그래서 제가 업로드를 하고 싶은 곡을 찾아서 업로드를 딱 하게 되면 그때서야 이제 유튜브 스튜디오에 저작권 딱지로 이제 확인을 할 수가 있습니다. 유튜브에 올리는 영상을 확인을 하면 네, 제가 K-POP 어, 잠시만요. 네. K-POP 유명 곡들은 저작권이 완벽하게 걸려 있는 곡이 정말 많기 때문에 수익을 창출할 수 없는 영상으로 업로드가 되는 경우가 많습니다. 그렇기 때문에 음악 크리에이터는 나의 자작곡이 아니면 완벽하게 수익을 창출할 수 없게 됩니다. 네, 유튜브 규정상 음악 편곡을 해서 영상을 제작하게 되면 2차 창작물로 받아들여져서 광고 수익을 저작권 소유자와 크리에이터 5대5로 광고 수익이 배분이 되는데요. 2차 창작물로라도 받아들여지려면 음악을 선정하고 편곡하고 녹음하고 업로드를 해야 하는데 이렇게 음원 하나가 만들어지기까지 정말 많은 생각과 소비되는 시간이 상당합니다. 그래서 일주일에 한 곡씩 자체적으로 곡을 만들어서 영상 콘텐츠화를 하기에는 
사실상 많은 어려움이 있습니다. 네. 네, 유튜브 크리에이터와 제작권에 대해서 말씀을 드리면 네. 음악 저작물 외에도 하나의 영상 콘텐츠를 만들기 위해서는 폰트, 자막, 이미지 그리고 다양한 소스들이 필요합니다. 그리고 그 모든 소스들은 저작권과 연결이 되어 있는데요. 보통 제 유튜브 업로드할 영상은 뮤비 영상입니다. 그래서 음원 소스는 제가 집에서 홈 레코딩으로 직접 녹음, 믹싱을 다 직접 하고 촬영, 편집도 제가 다 직접 하는 편입니다. 그래서 편집할 때 필요한 요소는 첫 번째로 뮤비에 들어갈 음원, 그리고 영상 파일, 가사 자막을 적어야 할 폰트, 그리고 마지막으로 썸네일까지 이렇게 네 가지입니다. 영상미를 위한 화질도 정말 중요하지만 가사 자막을 써야 할 폰트에 따라서 영상의 분위기가 정말 많이 바뀝니다. 네, 그래서 무료 폰트 제공 사이트를 검색해서 찾던 중 공유 마당을 발견해서 제 유튜브 영상에 정말 많은 도움이 되고 있습니다. 제가 많이 사용하는 사이트 중 무료 폰트와 썸네일을 다운받는 사이트가 있는데 그 사이트는 사실 제가 마음에 드는 소스를 이렇게 클릭을 하면 거의 유료라고 체크가 많이 되어 있는 거예요. 그래서 조금 마음에 안 드네 라고 생각을 하면 클릭하면 바로 그거는 무료라고 뜨더라고요. 그래서 공유 마당을 더 많이 찾게 되는 것 같습니다. 네, 유튜브에서 가장 민감한 저작물은 음악입니다. 다양한 소스 중에서도 가장 민감하고 저작권 침해 신고를 많이 받는 소스는 바로 음악 저작물입니다. 제 유튜브 채널에 업로드하는 영상은 커버 뮤비가 대부분이기 때문에 저작권이 안 걸린 영상이 사실 없어요. 그리고 유튜브 자체 AI에서 파악하는 음원의 길이가 4, 5초 정도라고 알고 있습니다. 근데 제 영상에 올리는 대부분 한 곡당 보통 4분 정도 곡이기 때문에 업로드를 하면 바로 이렇게 저작권 침해 신고가 되어버리는 경우가 많아요. 그래서 업로드를 한 후에 제가 2차 창작물로 이제 유튜브에 이 제기를 합니다. 네. 음악 크리에이터들은 음악으로 인해 저작권 침해 신고를 항상 당하기 때문에 음악 크리에이터의 현실은 정말 많은 수익을 창출할 순 없습니다. 네, 이러한 상황이라서 저작권 걱정이 없고 타인의 저작권을 침해하지 않으면서 사용할 수 있는 소스들이 절실하게 필요하다고 생각이 듭니다. 네, 그래서 여기서 공유마당의 활용인데요. 현재 제가 공유마당을 어떤 방법으로 활용하고 있는지에 대해서 말씀드리겠습니다. 저는 주로 제가 편곡하고 커버하고 싶은 곡이 있으면 먼저 공유 마당을 음악 카테고리에 들어가서 비슷한 느낌의 곡이 있는지를 먼저 확인을 합니다. 그리고 가야금과 분위기가 잘 맞는 곡이 있는지 들어보면서 연주를 해보기도 하고요. 요즘 인기 많은 곡의 스타일은 도대체 어떤 음악인지 느낌인지 분위기도 보고 그래서 마음에 드는 곡이 있으면 다운로드를 받아서 편곡도 해보고 커버곡으로도 활용을 하고 있습니다. 그리고 예부, 예부에서 의뢰를 받아서 작곡을 해야 하는 상황이 있으면 곡에 대한 영감을 얻기 위해 그래서 공유마당에 들어와서 다양한 음악 소스들을 듣고 작곡 편곡할 때도 많은 도움을 얻고 있습니다. 네, 2020년도에 제가 처음으로 공유마당에 음악 저작물을 활용해서 편곡한 지선상의 아리아입니다. 지선상의 아리아는 바흐의 관현악 모음가, 모음곡 가운데 가장 유명한 곡입니다. 이 곡을 가야금으로 편곡한 이유는 서양의 현악합주로서도 많은 사랑을 받는 클래식 곡이지만 우리나라를 대표하는 현악기인 가야금으로 저만의 편안한 음색으로 지선상의 아리아를 연주해도 잘 어울릴 것 같아서 작업을 했는데요. 역시나 서정적인 멜로디가 가야금과 잘 어울리는 것 같아서 편곡을 하면서도 정말 만족스러운 작업이었습니다. 네, 완성을 한 곡은 더 많은 분들이 저의 연주를 활용해 주셨으면 좋겠다는 마음을 희망하면서 CC BY로 공유를 했었습니다.
그리고 편곡한 이 곡을 저의 유튜브 채널에 우리나라의 멋과 함께 알리고 싶어서 전통 가옥을 찾아가서 한옥 앞에서 촬영을 해서 콘텐츠화를 시켜 업로드를 했었습니다. 네, 지선상의 아리아 곡과 비슷한 시기에 공유마당에 있는 세레나데라는 곡을 편곡해서 가야금 버전으로 함께 진행을 했었는데요. 세레나데는 하이든의 대표곡으로 알려져 있는 현악 사진주 곡입니다. 서정적이고 아름다운 선율로 대중들에게 인지도가 높은 곡중 하나입니다. 우리나라에선 통화 연결음으로 많이 쓰여서 마성의 BGM으로 속하고 있습니다. 네, 여러분들도 5초만 들으면 아실 거예요. 따다다다다다다다다다 이런 멜로디를 갖고 있는 곡입니다. 네, 이 곡을 공유한 이유는 클래식도 좋지만 국악을 더 널리 알리고 일상 속에서 자주 듣는 익숙한 곡을 우리나라 악기인 가야금으로 편곡해서 들려드리고 싶었습니다. 하이든의 대표곡인 세레나데 곡도 많은 분들이 활용하기를 희망하면서 CC BY로 공유 마당에 공유를 했었습니다. 네, 저는 음악 저작물 외에도 공유 마당에 있는 다양한 폰트와 이미지도 적극 활용을 하고 있는데요. 유튜브를 조회수를 늘리기 위해서는 아시다시피 처음에 보이는 게 썸네일이잖아요. 그래서 썸네일이 가장 중요하다고 생각을 하거든요. 그래서 초반에 유튜브 채널을 운영할 때에는 어떤 글씨체를 사용해서 썸네일을 제작해야지 구독자분들이 많이 볼까라는 생각에 썸네일 제작에 많은 고민과 시간을 소비를 했었습니다. 하지만 요즘에는 공유마당에 있는 이미지와 폰트 활용에서 저작권에 대한 부분을 많이 해결하다 보니까 정말 많은 시간을 아끼고 있어요. 네, 제 주변에 많은 크리에이터 동료들에게도 적극 추천을 하고 있고 이런 사이트가 있었냐며 정말 많은 관심을 갖고 있습니다. 그리고 이미 저보다 먼저 더 빠르게 공유마당에서 소스들을 적극적으로 활용하고 계시는 동료 크리에이터 분들도 많이 있었습니다. 공유마당 사이트의 큰 단점과 많은 공유가 이루어졌으면 좋겠다는 생각이 크리에이터로서의 바램입니다. 이처럼 저는 공유마당에 많은 도움을 받고 있습니다. 그래서 그 저작물들을 좋은 의미로 활용하게 해준 분들의 따뜻한 마음을 이어받아서 저도 저의 연주를 관심 가져주시고 사랑해주시는 분들에게 조금이나마 보답하고 싶은 마음으로 공유마당에 있는 음악 저작물 다섯 곡을 가야금 버전으로 편곡해서 이번에도 기증을 하게 되었습니다. 공유마당에 등록이 되어 있으니 자유롭게 많이 활용을 하실 수 있으니까요. 많은 활용 부탁드리겠습니다. 네. 공유 저작물인 빛의 세상으로와 2021 아리랑 응원가 같은 경우에는 지난주에 제 유튜브 채널에 업로드를 했습니다. 궁금하신 분들은 한번 들어보시면 좋을 것 같아요. 네. 정말 신기한 게 기증을 하면서도 제 자신이 너무 기특하고 기쁘고 뿌듯하고 기분이 좋아서 앞으로도 작업을 하다가 좋은 곡이 있으면 공유를 하고 싶은 마음이 정말 많이 들었습니다. 네. 네, 이처럼 저는 공유마당에 많은 도움을 받고 있습니다. 네, 요즘은 공유마당에 있는 이미지와 폰트 활용을 해서 저작권에 대한 부분을 많이 해결하다 보니까 정말 시간을 많이 아끼고 있어요. 네. 네, 계속 말씀드렸던 것처럼 저희 1인 유튜버 크리에이터들은 영상 콘텐츠를 만드는 사람입니다. 그리고 그 영상 콘텐츠는 경쟁력은 다양한 소스들이 함께 어우러져서 만들어집니다. 다양한 소스들은 일일이 창작하기에는 사실 너무 많은 현실적인 어려움이 있습니다. 그렇기 때문에 대부분의 크리에이터 분들이 저작권 문제에 있어서 매일같이 고민하고 신경을 쓰고 있습니다. 다양한 채널에서 무료로 제공하는 음악이나 이미지 등 다양한 소스들이 있습니다. 
하지만 무료 저작물들의 문제는 너무나 많이 사용되고 있고 사람들이 돌려 쓰다 보니까 그 저작물들은 양손증처럼 보입니다. 그래서 어디서 본 음악이나 이미지들이 매번 보이고 질리니까 새로움을 못 찾는 거죠. 그렇다 보니 영상 콘텐츠의 경쟁력이 정말 떨어집니다. 이래서 많은 크리에이터들이 해외에 있는 저작물들을 무료로 지불을 해서 저작물을 많이 사용을 하기도 합니다. 그렇지만 비싸기도 하고 너무나 많은 소스들을 매번 구입해서 사용하기에는 저뿐만 아니라 모든 크리에이터 분들이 부담이 클 거라는 생각이 사실 듭니다. 네, 앞서 잠깐 말씀드렸지만 정말 저는 공유마당에 많은 도움을 받고 있습니다. 그리고 크리에이터들의 꿈을, 꿈꾸는 아이들도 정말 많이 도움을 줄수 있을 것이라고 생각합니다. 그래서 그 미래의 크리에이터와 많은 국민들이 제가 기증한 저작물을 활용해서 2차 창작물을 만들고 또다시 그 창작물들이 공유 저작물로 활용되는 긍정적인 선순환 구조가 만들어지면 정말 건강한 저작권 생태계가 만들어질 것이라고 생각이 듭니다. 앞으로도 유튜브 활동을 꾸준히 하면서 끊임없이 발전하는 가야진 연주로 언제 어디서나 선한 영향력을 마구 누릴 수 있는 가야진 예지가 되겠다는 말씀을 드리면서 오늘 저께 마무리 하도록 하겠습니다. 네. 감사합니다. 네, 고맙습니다. 정말 아름다운 마음을 가진 창작자이자 연주자가 아닐까라는 생각이 듭니다. 어, 조금 더 많은 창작자들이 갖고 있는 이 작품으로 더 나은 창작물을 만들 수 있도록 이렇게 어, 작품을 기증해 주시고 우리 오늘 강연까지 함께해 주신 가야금 예지님께 진심으로 감사드리겠습니다. 계속해서 이어가겠습니다. 어, 이번에는 네, 퍼블릭 도메인 연구소장이자 듀크 대학교 로스쿨의 교수님이신 네, 제니퍼 젠킨스 교수님께서 공유 저작물의 날이라는 주제로 발표를 함께 해 주시겠습니다. 역시 영상으로 준비가 되어 있는데요. 지금부터 여러분과 함께 보겠습니다. Hello everyone. My name is Jennifer Jenkins. I am the director of the Center for the Study of the Public Domain at Duke Law School. We were the first university center in the world devoted to the public domain. We've been around for over 20 years now. So I wanted to begin by thanking the Korea Copyright Commission for this invitation. I'm so sorry I can't be there in person, but I'm delighted to be able to join you virtually for the public domain and open source SW licensing conference. So the public domain, why are we celebrating it? Why are we dedicated to it? It's the realm of material that's unprotected by intellectual property rights and free for all to use and build upon. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the role and the multifaceted value of the public domain. And I'm also going to introduce you to one of our flagship projects, which is called Public Domain Day in the United States. What is Public Domain Day? It's a celebration that we hold January 1st of every year to talk about and generate excitement about the works that are going into the public domain in the United States that year. It's actually one of our most widely read projects. Since its inception in 2010, our series of articles have been viewed over 2 million times and widely covered in the mainstream media and also the wonky IP media, online, in print, on radio, on TV. Our articles have been one of the nation's leading sources of information about the public domain, and we hope that they have raised awareness about its role, its value, and also the broader implications of copyright policy. So why do so many people celebrate the public domain? Why are people so excited about what used to seem like a fairly sleepy corner of intellectual property law? We think it's about the balance that's necessary for the intellectual property system to function properly. Our economy, our culture, our technology depend on a delicate balance between that which is and is not protected by exclusive intellectual property rights. Copyrights and patents give authors and inventors important 
critical rights that encourage creativity, innovation, distribution. That's extremely important, but these rights are the yin to the yang of the public domain and its own contributions to access, to creativity, to invention. So both the incentives provided by intellectual property rights and the freedoms provided by the public domain are crucial to that balance and crucial to a well-functioning intellectual property system. At the bottom of your slide, you see a quote from Karen Temple, one of our former registers of copyrights with the United States Copyright Office. She says, it is important to recognize that when a work enters the public domain, it does not represent the death or the end of copyright. Rather, it is part of copyright's life cycle, the next stage of life for that creative work. So let's talk about the public domain. As I just mentioned, it's essential to creativity. It's essential to innovation. And it actually, in the US, furthers a constitutional objective. The United States Constitution says that patent and copyright laws must promote the progress of science and the useful arts. What is the public domain? It's our collective cultural and scientific heritage, the raw materials for future expression future research, for democratic dialogue, for education, for journalism. It includes a number of different things. It includes, most obviously perhaps, creative works and inventions whose copyright and patent terms have expired. Patent terms expire for utility patents after 20 years, design patents after 15 years. Our copyright term, like yours in Korea, I believe, is now life of the author plus another 70 years and 95 years for works of corporate authorship. For earlier, older works that I'll be talking about shortly in this presentation, it's 95 years from publication. So the public domain includes those works, but it also includes aspects of those works, such as raw data, such as facts, ideas, genres, themes, scientific principles, theories, formulae, laws of nature, things that are never eligible for intellectual property rights in the first place. And finally, of course, it includes works that predated IP laws entirely, like the works of Shakespeare. So that's what's in the public domain. In the United States, government works are also in the public domain. So that includes all works of the United States government, legislation, regulations, legal opinions, hearings, and this is a lot of fun for, for space enthusiasts, creative output from government projects, such as all of the photographs from NASA and the amazing images that have recently been taken from the James Webb Space Telescope. All of that material from the United States government is in the public domain. And it's not only exciting for researchers and scientists and fans and enthusiasts, but it also generates a great deal of economic value. So returning to the question, why are we celebrating the public domain? Why are we celebrating all of this stuff that lives in that realm call, that we call the public domain? Well, one reason is because of creativity. The public domain is the wellspring of creativity. As I mentioned earlier, it's a core part of the copyright system. When works enter the public domain, or when we look at things like facts and ideas, those aspects of works that are, that are always in the public domain, that means future creators are free to use that material and with public domain works to rediscover and reimagine those works without having to track down the copyright owners and get permission or pay a fee and without having to worry about a lawsuit. So on your screen, you see Shakespeare there to the left. Um, when Shakespeare was writing, there was no copyright and he's well known for borrowing heavily from his predecessors. All of that was in the public domain. But Shakespeare's works, which also predated copyright, have given us a wealth of plays, reimaginings, movies, books, including perhaps 10 Things I Hate About You and Kiss Me Kate, which both drew on Taming of the Shrew. And of course, all the thousands of remakes of Romeo and Juliet, including West Side Story. 
So there's one example of creativity. In the middle, you see F. Scott Fitzgerald's 1925 book, The Great Gatsby, which entered the public domain in the US a couple of years ago in 2021. So after it entered the public domain, what happened? There were a wealth of new editions with introductions from Pulitzer Prize winners and other scholars that brought fresh analysis nearly a century later, looking at what was in The Great Gatsby through the lens of history and rethinking what our ideas of being American now entail. There were also new works, such as a prequel called Nick, which tells the story of one of the characters in The Great Gatsby from that character's perspective. There was a comic book adaptation. There was, of course, a zombie edition, as there always is. It was called The Great Gatsby Undead. And uh, apparently an animated movie, as well as, Gat as well as the Gatsby musicals in the works. So these are just the kinds of creative reuses that the public domain enables and that we saw just two years ago when a very prominent work entered the public domain in the US. Another example you'll see on your slide is the WNYC, that's a radio station in New York City project where they invited singers, guitar players, writers to create songs based on public domain material. And they got 80 wonderful adaptations from the whimsical to the really serious. So these are just some concrete examples, including some very recent examples of what kinds of creativity the public domain enables. But the public domain isn't only about creativity, it's also about access. It removes barriers to access. This promotes equality and makes things more affordable. I mean, kids anywhere can download these works from the internet. It makes education more affordable and more interactive. On your screen, you will see the titles of some empirical studies from scholars that show that when books enter the public domain, they become less expensive. They're more likely to be in print in circulation. They're avail available in more editions and more formats including audiobook and braille versions. So the public domain is about creativity. It's about access. It's also about preservation, preservation of our cultural heritage. As I mentioned earlier, copyright lasts a long term, long time, 95 years from publication, life of the author plus another 70 years. What this means is that by the time copyrights expire, many of these works have been forgotten. They're languishing in obscurity. And sadly, sometimes they're lost entirely. An estimated 80% of films from the 1920s have already de decayed beyond repair because they were on substrates that deteriorated, disintegrated, sometimes even prone to spontaneous combustion. And some of these older films that were still copyrighted have disintegrated while preservationists were eagerly waiting for them to enter the public domain so that they could legally digitize them without worrying about a copyright lawsuit. Most of the works entering the public domain after nearly a century of copyright protection are out of circulation. No one's been enjoying them. They're not being sold anywhere. When these pieces of history enter the public domain, it means that anyone can preserve preservation and make them available, put them up on the internet, digitize them where we can rediscover and breathe new life into them. So creativity, access, preservation, education. Then there's also economic value. So the public domain is not just some forgotten place where things become free and people can enjoy them and it's all warm and fuzzy and you feel good about it. It's that too. But it also feeds the economy. It's valuable. You'll see on your slide um, a 2015 article that tries to map the size and value creation from the public domain and the frequency of its use. And one estimate from that article is that the public domain images on Wikipedia might generate a cost savings of around 200 million US dollars annually. So the materials in the public domain and what they enable also have economic value. And we've been talking a lot about copyrighted works. That's what our public domain day site features. But 
the range of things I talked about, inventions whose patents have expired, raw materials, ideas, facts, formulas, laws of nature, all of this material that's in the public domain is essential to technological progress. The public domain feeds science, it's research, it's essential for text and data mining, for mass digitization projects, and something of great interest to this conference, I think, how does generative AI become what we see today? These amazing image generators, uh, these amazing chatbots, for good or for ill, what they train on pre-existing materials. Public domain materials are free for training generative AI. Right now in the United States, we have a number of lawsuits testing whether training generative AI with works that are still under copyright is free under the fair use doctrine or not. We don't have decisions yet. There are very good arguments that it is a fair use. There are arguments against it as well. We will see court cases about that coming down. The point being, AI learns to be AI from other from other works when those works are in the public domain. Uh, the uncertainty about whether there's copyright infringement is removed. So the public domain is important, as are intellectual property rights. But the balance has been shifting over the years. The public domain has been severely diminished by copyright term extensions. Until 1978 in the United States, our copyright term was 28 years, with an option to renew for another 28 years. 85% of works didn't renew suggesting that it wasn't economically necessary. Many of those works had already finished their commercial lifespan. And as you can see on your screen, our term has gotten longer and longer and longer. And as I mentioned, now it's life plus 70 years for works by natural authors. What this means is that you're unlikely to see any works created in your lifetime enter the public domain. Now, if all of these works were benefiting someone, that might be one thing. But in most cases, this expansive term is not offset by benefit to any rights holder because it outlasts the commercial lifespan, vastly outlasts of most material. I would be delighted if everything I created was still in circulation, if anyone wanted to pay for it 70 years after my, my death. But the fact is, that's not how long most works are commercially viable. So what this means is that the copyright term goes on and on and on. But for most works, the vast majority, no one is benefiting from the continued copyright, yet the material remains off limits to users who are unwilling to risk a lawsuit. Histories are incomplete. Artists cannot build on their cultural heritage. Books are languishing in obscurity. And if you look at our most recent term extension there in 1998, the timing of that was especially ironic because just as the World Wide Web was developing to the point where we gained the capacity to make all of this culture digitally available, we denied it to ourselves, in most cases, for no good reason. So the copyright term has extended, which has diminished the public domain. So what that means is when we first launched our public domain day website, we weren't actually celebrating works entering the public domain because not a single work was entering the public domain. Not a single published work was entering the public domain in the United States. So we began writing this website in 2010 as a counterfactual. They were celebrating in other countries where works were entering the public domain after a life plus 70 term. Our term extension had frozen the public domain for two decades. And so we thought, well, We'll write a counterfactual and talk about what could be entering the public domain under that term we had until 1978. Then finally, in 2019, we had the grand reopening of the public domain. For the first time in over 20 years, on January 1st, 2019, published works began to enter the US public domain again. And I can tell you the excitement was incredible from all corners. I could not believe how thrilled people were that works were entering the public domain in the United States again. 
so how do we write the site? Each year, months and months of research, um, determining the public domain status of works can be both factually and legally complex. We pour through the catalog log of copyright entries, through records, we generate our list, and then we write um, pages that may be of special interest. For instance, we wrote a page especially about Winnie the Pooh uh, a few years ago. Um, so we generate our lists, we write all of our educational material about the public domain, and uh, we'll give you a little preview of what's coming up next year in just a second. So why did I mention next year, 2024? Well, in 1928, there was an animated short called Steamboat Willie, which was the first appearance of Mickey Mouse, the mouse you now know as Mickey Mouse. So the copyright term for works back then, 95 years, and then they go into the public domain January 1st of the night of the subsequent year. So what that means is Steamboat Willie is going into the public domain on January 1st, 2024. I can already tell you that there is so much excitement about this just because of how famous and beloved uh, Mickey Mouse is. Disney owns Mickey Mouse, but if you think about it, Disney is one of the best examples of the value of the public domain. Think about all those wonderful animated movies that Disney made. Many of them were based on public domain works, whether it's Alice's Adventure, Wonderland, Sleeping Beauty, Pinocchio, The Little Mermaid, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, all the remakings of, from the fairy tales of the Brothers Grimm. So Disney itself is a great example of the value of the public domain. They took these public domain works and made beautiful animated movies on them. And next year, when Steamboat Willie enters the public domain, that means we can all do the same with that animated short. Not with copyrighted aspects of newer versions of Mickey Mouse, that should be clear. But with Steamboat Willie, that's in the public domain and it's free for us to use, think about, play with, reimagine, and that will be very exciting. So if you'd like to learn more, just Google Public Domain Day Duke. I think it should be the first thing that comes up for Google. There's a wealth of information frequently asked questions, legal information, tons and tons and tons of stuff. So if you want to learn more, please visit our website, Viva Copyright, Viva Patent, Viva the Public Domain. I hope your conference is going well. We send you very warm regards from the United States. And thank you again to the Rio Copyright Commission. Um, greetings to everyone. Thanks so much for your time. Bye. 고맙습니다. 공유 저작물의 날에 대해서 또 그의 의미와 가치 그리고 우리가 어떤 역할을 그 날을 준비하면서 맞이하면서 하는지까지 자세하게 살펴주셨습니다. 제니퍼 제킨슨 교수님께도 젠킨스 교수님께도 감사 인사드리겠습니다. 이렇게 정말 긴 시간 동안 2023 공유 저작물 및 오픈 소스 소프트웨어 라이센스 컨퍼런스 진행을 했습니다. 아마 함께하고 계신 분들께는 아, 정말 다양한 정보를 나누는 유익한 시간이 되지 않으셨을까라는 생각이 들고요. 저희 마무리하면서 이제 끝까지 자리해 주신 분들께 감사하는 의미로 경품 추첨의 시간도 또 준비를 했으니까 함께해 주시면 감사드리겠습니다. 어, 지금 그 퇴차하고 계시는 명찰 뒷면에 보시면 아마 여러분들의 번호가 있을 겁니다. 아, 그 경품 번호를 저희가 경품 추첨을 통해서 맞춰서 당첨되신 분들께 선물을 드릴 예정이니까요. 경품 번호를 확인해 주시면 감사드리겠고요. 당초 어, 신청을 하셨던 분들보다 좀 많은 분들이 오셔서 혹시 번호가 없는 분들께서는 지금 손을 좀 들어주시면 저희가 번호를 부여해 드리겠습니다. 조금만 들어주고 계시면 뒤쪽부터 지금 나눠주고 계십니다. 저희 앞쪽으로 네, 한 번만 더 손을 들어주세요. 네, 손 들어주시면 지금 세분더 계시는 것 같아요. 네, 나눠드리겠습니다. 두분 더. 예. 그러면 모두 다 받으셨죠? 네. 한분 더. 옆, 옆 분, 한분 더. 예. <웃음> 네, 그러면 이렇게 경품 번호를 다, 다 나눠 가지셨습니다. 그럼 지금부터 경품 추첨할 텐데, 저희 추첨하기 전에 마지막 추첨은 모두 다 일어나서 나가시더라고요. 그래서 주차권 관련된 정보 잠깐 전해드리겠습니다. 어, 저희가 그 시스템이 복원이 돼서 아마 주차권 관련해서 등록해달라고 말씀을 휴식 시간에 드렸는데요.
혹시 차량 정보가 없는 경우가 있습니다. 어, 저희가 복원하는 과정에서 오류가 생긴 것 같은데 차량 정보가 없다 하시는 분들께서는 나가실 때 컨퍼런스에 참여하셨다는 말씀을 해주시면 어, 무료로 이용하실 수 있으니까 참고해 주시기 바라겠습니다. 여러분 많이 기다리고 계시니까 어느 때보다도 눈이 반짝반짝한 시간 <웃음> 네, 경품 추첨 지금부터 진행하겠습니다. 먼저 3만 원 상당의 삼성 블루투스 마우스에 대한 추첨을 하겠는데요. 다섯 분을 추첨하겠고요. 다섯 분 올라오시면 모두 한꺼번에 저희 전달은 잠시 후에 한국저작권위원회 차태훈 본부장님께서 해주시겠습니다. 먼저 경품 추첨부터 함께 하겠습니다. 너무 오래 기다리시니까 추첨하겠습니다. 먼저 삼성 블루투스 마우스 다섯 분에 대한 추첨입니다. 자, 어떤 분이 당첨되셨을까요? 번호 182번 혹시 계세요? 네, 182번. 예, 예, 우리 귀빈께서 당첨이 되셨습니다. 네, 다음 번호 추첨하겠습니다. 20번 계세요? 20번, 네. 한번더 추첨하겠습니다. 다섯 분. 아, 네, 감사합니다. 이런 환호 너무 감사해요. 108번, 네, 계시고요. 그리고 한번더 추첨하겠습니다. 101번, 101번. 세 번으로 안 계시면 넘어갑니다. 101번, 한번더 추첨하겠습니다. 59번, 59번 안 계시면 감사하고요. 한번더 추첨하겠습니다. 80번, 계신가요? 80번, 넘어가겠습니다. 167번, 167번도 넘어가겠습니다. 네, 한번 더, 29번, 네, 계시고요. 한 번만 더 추첨하겠습니다. 지금 네분 되셨죠? 네 분. 네. 한번 더. 70번. 아, 네. 지금 당첨되신 분들 모두 다 앞쪽으로 나와주시기 바랍니다. 저희 삼성 블루투스 마우스 차태원 부부장님께서 직접 전달을 해드리겠습니다. 네. 어서 오십시오. 기분 좋게. 예, 올라와 주세요. 네, 올라오세요. 네. 기분 좋게 오늘 하루 마무리하실 수 있을 것 같아요. 네, 어서 오십시오. 네, 축하드립니다. 함께해 주셔서 감사드려요. 네, 본부장님께서 직접, 네, 직접, 예. 네 분밖에 안 계시네요. 아, 네, 한분 더. 네, 예. <웃음> 바로 뒤돌아서 우리 본부장님께서 전달을 해주고 계세요. 네, 한분 더. 네, 그래도 우리 이렇게 좋은 날인데 행운에 당첨된 날. 사진 촬영 하셔야겠지요. 예, 우리 문철규 의원님께서 좀 쑥스러워 하시는데 이런 행운도 쉽게 오지 않습니다. 200분 중에 200명의 번호 중에 네 다섯 분 밝은 미소로 함께 하겠습니다. 네, 진심으로 축하드립니다. 고맙습니다. 본부장님 조금만 더 애써주세요. 저희 이번에는 2등 경품 20만 원 상당의 삼성 갤럭시 버즈 블루투스 아이폰 이어폰입니다. 네. 자, 그러면 지금부터 2등 경품 추첨하겠습니다. 몇 번일까요? 보여 주세요. 144번. 안 계시죠? 더안 불러 되겠죠? 계신가요? 144번. 144번 아니시죠? 네, 아니십니다. 한번더 보여 주세요. 120번. 네, 저요. 예. 아, 좋은 상품 가져가시네요. 축하드립니다. 네, 신나는 발걸음으로 무대에 오고 계십니다. 축하드립니다. 끝까지 함께 해주셔서 감사드리겠고요. 앞으로도 저희 컨퍼런스에 많은 관심 부탁드립니다. 사진도 한 번, 네, 아우, 갤럭시라고 써 있는 네, 가장 기분 좋은 순간이죠. 고맙습니다. 네, 이제 어, 1등 상품입니다. 1등 상품은 LG 에어로 퍼니처 공기청정기 40만 원 상당의 저 이거 정말 갖고 싶은 청정기예요. 위에 이렇게 테이블이 있어서 아주 어, 디자인이 좋은 그런 청정기입니다. 이 상품은 들고 가시기 무, 무거우시니까 <웃음> 저희가 일단 판넬로 전달 드리고 추후에 배달해 주시는 거죠. 네, 네, 배달 서비스까지 갑니다. 자, 과연 1등 경품 누구에게 돌아갈까요? 번호 보여주세요. 아이씨, 네. 아이씨까지 나왔어요. 95번. 아이씨 괜찮습니다. 안 계시면 한번더 기회가 있어요. 다이나믹하게 안 계시죠? 한번더안 부르겠습니다. 네, 두근두근두근. 한번더 번호 추첨하겠습니다. 돌려주세요. 155번. 
아 조용히 일어나시고 옆분은 거의 <웃음> 자지러지셨는데 굉장히 조용히 일어나셨어요 네 축하드립니다 맑은 공기 속에 함께해 주시기 바랍니다 아 누가 봐도 창작자분 같은데 네잘 쓰시기 바랍니다 꽃다발도 준비가 돼 있네요 예 축하드립니다 예 차태원 본부장님과 밝은 미소로 네아 드디어 미소가 나오고 있어요 예 축하드립니다 네 다시 한번 감사드리겠습니다 차태원 본부장님께서도 함께 해주셔서 진심으로 감사드리겠습니다 아 역시 그래도 끝까지 남아 계시네요 다시 한번 끝까지 함께 해주신 여러분께 감사 인사드리겠고요 내년에는 더욱더 좋은 모습으로 함께 커버런스 준비하겠습니다 내년에도 많은 관심 부탁드리겠습니다 돌아가시는 길 편안하십시오 감사합니다